All right, thank you, Grace, and welcome everyone to the webinar. As Grace said, I'll be discussing the load rating and rehabilitation of the New River Gorge Bridge. This is an ongoing project that Ferguson Nipel is working on in our Columbus, Ohio, and Parkersburg, West Virginia offices. Uh, this first slide provides some background information on the New River Gorge Bridge. It's located near Fayetteville, West Virginia, and it's owned by the West Virginia Department of Transportation. It was constructed between June 1974 and October 1977. The length of the main arch span is 1,705 feet, and the overall length is 3,031 feet. Its height above the New River is 876 feet, and it has the distinction of being the longest steel arch bridge in the Western Hemisphere. It was listed on the National Register for Historic Structures in 2013. One of the most notable features of the bridge is how high it is. When you visit the site, it's, it's hard to tell, hard to get a feel for the scale of the bridge because of the size of the valley and the distance you have to be at in order to, to see everything. So this is a photograph of an information board that's at the visitor center near the bridge that helps you get a sense of the scale of how high it is over the river. So they use a couple of structures most of us are probably familiar with, the Washington Monument and the Statue of Liberty. And you can see that you can stack two Statues of Liberty on top of the Washington Monument and still be a little bit shy of the low court of the Arch Trust. This is a similar graphic from the West Virginia, it's from a tourism website for West Virginia. And they use the Washington Monument and the Statue of Liberty and a number of other famous landmarks and just set them next to the bridge for comparison. You can see it, it falls somewhere between the Eiffel Tower and the St. Louis Arch as far as how high it is from the river. Burgess and Nipel has some history with the bridge. We've been performing yearly inspections since 2008. In the photos, you can see some of our inspectors on the bridge. They access every member at arm's length, and they use the combination of techniques to reach the different parts of the bridge. They climb and repel, and they also use some mechanical access equipment to, to get to the different components. And you can see this is not something you want to volunteer for if you're afraid of heights. So stemming from our inspection work, West Virginia DOT asked us to do a, a load rating of the bridge that incorporated the deficiencies that we found during our inspections. So we were scoped to rate all the primary members on the bridge, meaning those that carry live load, and also all the gusset plate connections, and also all the member splices and other connections on the bridge. Uh, during the scoping process, we also recommended that wind and temperature forces be included in the rating since those were potentially significant given the size and the, and the exposure of the bridge. And we were scoped to include a total of 10 different live load cases, HS20 design load, five West Virginia legal loads, and also four coal, coal resource transportation loads, which are axle configurations used by the coal industry. So what this worked out to was a, a monumental load rating effort we would be rating over 4,500 members, 871 gusset plates, and over 1,000 non-gusset connections. So this would be the largest single load rating project b had ever done. And we put a lot of thought into the methods we would use to carry it out. Uh, the, the first question was modeling. Bridge had lots of interrelated components, so what would the model look like and, and how many models would we need? The second question, it's probably the biggest, was how, how would we gather and control all the data we would need to construct the model and to perform the rating calculation? And third, once we had the model and all the data, how do we take all that information and turn it into load ratings for these thousands of members and connections? So 
So the first question that needed to be addressed was this modeling. And the, the question of what software to use was not a difficult one. BNN's had a long history with MIDAS, and we've used it successfully on past projects for West Virginia DOT. It handles large structures well, and it works well with Microsoft Excel, which we were using to collect the data. And with MIDAS, we decided we could manage this essentially with one large model of the entire structure. We would use a single main model for both the live loading and the temperature loading. And we would break out the wind loading into a second version of that same model where we would include geometric nonlinear effects. And although we included the stringers in the main model, we, we separated their rating out so we could use calculated distribution factors that wouldn't be included in that main model. Looking at the configuration of the structure, the bridge has three units with finger joints located at, between, at, the, at the unit boundaries at, at VINs 5 and VINs 19. Uh, those are the, the first approach bench that are not part of the arch structure. Uh, the approaches in units one and three have a similar configuration. They're uh, truss spans that rest on bents at about 130 to 140 foot spans. The deck truss in the approach spans is fixed at the abutments, longitudinally fixed, and it's pinned to top the top of all of those bends so that those bends just sway with the movement of the truss. Um, unit two, the deck truss rests on the on those boundary bends, the bend five and nineteen between unit one and two and between unit two and three, it rests on roller bearings and it is it is fixed to the spandrel bends that connect the deck truss to the arch. So once again those those interior bends just sway with the thermal movement of the, of the deck truss, and the, all the expansion for, for all three units is carried at, those, at the boundary piers. So there are finger joints between unit one and unit two, and between unit two and unit three that, that carry all the movement of the structure. The next few slides walk through some of the different components in the bridge model. Uh, this is the base of the arch. All the main truss members, the cords and the diagonals and the posts, were modeled as pin-pin members. We assumed they were axial only. That's how the bridge was designed. And uh, the arch also has top and bottom lateral bracing members. And it's got sway bracing under each of the, the spandrel vents. Uh, there are a mix of cross-section types here. The main truss members and the arch are all closed box sections. And the bracing members are primarily I sections. This is a shot of the deck truss portion of the model. Again, the, the main members, the diagonals, cords, and posts are all modeled as axial only members. The floor beams are also trusses that are the same depth as the deck truss. Uh, the top cord of the floor beam truss is a box member that directly supports the stringers. So you can see if you look closely at the, at the model, the node locations, which are, are breaks in the member, those are the stringer bearing points. So the stringers don't all sit over truss members. So that top member is, has combined bending and compression. So it is rated that way. Uh, the deck trusses also have bottom lateral bracing that frames into the low cord of those 14 trusses. And here are the bents. Uh, there are two distinct types, the approach bents and the spandrel bents. Uh, the approach bents are fixed at the base. They carry moment down to the base, and they are pinned to the superstructure above. Uh, the spandrel bents are treated as pinned pin to both the arch truss and to the the deck truss above. And I'm going to show you the next few slides some photos of how those vents tie into the deck truss. This is a photo of a, a typical vent bearing condition at the deck truss. Uh, you can see there's, there's an actual pin in the bearing. 
it allows the deck truss to pivot relative to the bend. But there's no provision for longitudinal movement. So when thermal movement of the truss occurs, this bearing actually pulls the, the bend along with the truss. Here's how we represented this in the model. We used an elastic link to connect the low cord of the deck truss to the top of the bent column. And we released the top node of this link for rotation, but not translation to allow that deck truss to pivot. This is a photo of the bearing condition at the expansion vents at 5 and 19. You can see a pin connection similar to the other pin connections on the approach side, and then a very large roller bearing on the main span side. So remembering that the approach spans are fixed at the abutment, that, that pinned approach bearing actually pulls these bents back towards the abutment or away depending on, the, depending on the direction of thermal movement. At the same time, the main span is expanding and contracting and, and pulling the, the top of that roller bearing in the other direction. So the roller bearing moves from both from above and below, and then all of that movement is taken by the, the finger joints above. This is how we modeled that bearing condition. Uh, we're using a series of four elastic links, two rigid links that connect the top node of the bent column to the bearing points, and then two more links representing the bearings with the top nodes on one side released for rotation only, on the other side released for rotation and translation to represent those bearing conditions. Here we're looking at the stringer floor beam connection. And here again we're using an elastic link and we're releasing the, the top node of that link to allow those stringers to rotate relative to the floor beams to represent the flexibility of that connection. Um, there's also, um, there are stringer release joints over the length of the bridge that allow some expansion and contraction in the stringers relative to the floor beams and those are modeled by using member end releases for longitudinal movement in the stringer members themselves. And we are including deck cross beams that span from stringer to stringer in order to carry the live loads we're applying to the bridge. The, the deck itself is non-composite and it's not modeled in the longitudinal directions. These function only to, in, in the transverse direction, to distribute the, the moving loads to the stringers. Uh, and we're releasing each of these cross beams for a moment at each stringer connection, so we're not modeling the deck as continuous. It's just modeled as a simple span from stringer to stringer. For the application of live loads, we're using Midas's moving load generator to apply the loads directly to the cross beams. We're looking at live loads in various positions across the width of the bridge to make sure we catch the maximum live load range on each member. We're using a total of 24 lane locations, including both the design lanes for the HS20 trucks, which move from barrier to barrier, and also the striped lanes, which we use for the legal loads and, and the uh, coal resource trucks. Um, that brings us to a total of 55 moving load cases. That includes all of those different, 10 different moving load vehicles we're including in the rating. The wind analysis, we made a second copy of that main model and applied only wind and dead load. So we investigated a total of 12 different wind combinations on the bridge representing various different angles of wind application. Um, we loaded the bridge simultaneously with a single wind case and dead load and ran that as a geometric nonlinear analysis for each of those 12 cases. And this allowed us to catch the second order effects that occur when the, we get lateral movement 
of the deck truss and, and the deck relative to the supports and get some additional overturning in the arch truss below. Um, for each wind case investigated, we then pulled those results, subtracted the dead load back out and used the, the difference as the wind load that we then used in the, in the rating cal calculations. So back when we identified the, the questions we were going to have to answer early in the process, one of them was modeling, which we've addressed. The second was data management. And this slide's a representation of what we came up with for a plan of how we would collect and manage the, the data we collected. Our main concern was given the volume of what we were going to have to collect, that we didn't want to have to handle the same information multiple times. So once we entered the plate sizes for a member to use in the model, we didn't want to have to enter them again to calculate the member weight or to or the capacity of that member. So the key here is the big box at the top, which is the, the database. We wanted to use a, a single location to collect all the information we needed about every member and every connection, and then not, not have to look back at the plans again when we needed that information again. So within that database, we, connected, we collected the node coordinates, the member data, the section properties, the dead loads, the live load cases, and section loss, everything we needed. And then from that data, we created our model, calculated the capacity, and performed the rating. We were able to use MIDAS's .mct file, which is a text version of the MIDAS input, to create the MIDAS input directly from our database. So we used a Visual Basic macro within Excel to write that MCT file directly from, from the database. So if anything changed in the database, if we found an error in member properties or added section loss, we could just go back, hit a button, and recreate that MIDAS file from scratch rather than have to go into the file and edit to change it in addition to changing our database. This slide shows a little bit of the nuts and bolts of how the data collection worked. Um, this is a, a section data worksheet from our database, and then a cut from the design plans, the bridge. Um, we set up that data collection sheet so we could use the same sheet for all of the member types on the bridge, be they I-beams or single cell boxes, multiple cell boxes, rolled sections. And one engineer would go through, pull that data, and we would have a second engineer go through and check each line of that data when we had two sets of initials on each line of the spreadsheet to, to verify everything was recorded and checked. We used a similar system for section losses, which were recorded in our inspection reports. Um, we recorded each measured loss for each member, and we, we, we could give a thickness and a length and a location for that loss that could be recorded in a line of that spreadsheet. And then we, we also created a graphical tool that would draw that draw the cross section of the member and, and locate on there where those losses occurred to, to verify we had recorded them correctly. So in the graphic to the right, you can see the red indicates section loss location. The blue indicates a hand hole access hole opening in the member. So it made it easy to look at that and verify that we had correctly recorded what we had observed in the field. The final step in the rating process was to calculate the capacities and the rating factors for each member. We used Excel, an Excel spreadsheet Again, that would import the, the model results, the section data, the section loss, and, the, and then all that from our database, and then output the member capacity and a rating factor for that member. Um, these are a couple of screenshots from the spreadsheet we used. On the right side, uh, you can see the member section, including the losses that we had recorded. And again, an, an access hole opening in blue. Um, we set this spreadsheet up so we could make a batch run for all the members to get a full set of ratings. So we could 
put all this member in, hit a button, run, and have it give a rating for each member. Or we could also go back, look at an individual member, and then look at detail calculations for that member to understand what the controlling force was and, and, and whether we agreed with the conclusion of that rating. The member, the member capacity calculations for the bent legs were a special case because these were uh, steel box sections that were tapered over their length. Um, they're very long columns that have the potential to be controlled by elastic flexural buckling. And hand calculating the buckling strength for a tapered column is a, is a complicated task. So we decided to make use of the linear buckling analysis feature in might have simple to help us come up with capacity for those members. To carry out the analysis, we created separate models for each of the 21 bends. Uh, we added lateral supports at the bracing locations, and we set in supports to match the support conditions in the main model. We placed a unit load at the top of the column and ran a linear buckling analysis. The results you get from that analysis are eigenvalues, which are, represent the multiplier applied to the, the loading before buckling occurred. So since we used a unit load, the first eigenvalue is equal to the controlling buckling load. Uh, we recorded both the controlling x-axis and y-axis buckling load for each member and then included that in our capacity calculations for those members. And I'm going to talk now a bit about the gusset plate ratings. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there were a lot of these, 871. And the gussets of this bridge were very large and very complicated, which you can, you can see in the photos here. So once again, we're going to spend a lot of time collecting data. And the way we did this was important to our efficiency. And we would also require, again, a team of, of engineers to collect it. So we wanted the, a system that we could use consistently. This is an illustration of the system we used to collect the data. And we, we imported images of the, the shop drawings into CAD. We scaled the images based on the dimensions in the images so that they were to scale in CAD. And then we could draw lines directly on those images and make measurements from the CAD drawing. And if you're familiar with custom plate rating, you can, you'll recognize some of the marks we've made on here. We, we would draw the Whitmore section on block shear failures and then horizontal and vertical shear planes within the plate and measure those directly from CAD. The other advantage to CAD is it, it let us make an electronic record of everything we did. So it was easy for a checker to come back in and verify that, that those measurements were made correctly. In cases where we didn't have the data in the shop drawings that we needed for a given plate, we, we could use field data to verify that plate. Uh, this is a photo of a, of a gusset plate taken by our inspectors. Uh, they placed magnetic rulers on that plate, which would allow us to then pull that into CAD and scale it, and then draw on it and measure it in the same manner we would use a shop drawing. We did this very sparingly on this project because we had good shop drawings of almost every connection, but we have in the past done entire bridges using this method and, and scaling directly from photographs. One thing that adds some complexity to gusset plate rating is the need for concurrent forces at the connections. So with member load ratings, we can just take an envelope of the forces of the member and just look at the minimum and the maximum and verify that what rating controls based on that. Um, with gusset plates, using, an envelope, using envelope forces can be overly conservative. So for the plate you see here, if, if you were to take the two cord members and use the maximum compression in one cord member and simultaneously the minimum compression in the adjacent cord, you would have to assume that the, the difference between those numbers was carried in, 
across that shear plane that connects it to the, the diagonal and the post member. Uh, with the large forces on this bridge, that difference could be enormous. So in order to rate these plates accurately, we needed to look at concurrent forces for each connection and check multiple load cases for each connection to, to verify what the controlling case is. So how do we get the concurrent forces? Um, MIDAS is able to provide you with concurrent cases for any load condition. So the next couple of slides I'll walk through how you accomplish this within MIDAS. Um, first, after, you, after you've run your analysis with moving loads applied, you can go to the moving load tracer tool in the results menu. This allows you to select any force in any member, have MIDAS show you the, the loading it used to produce that force. So here I've picked a lower cord member in the, in the deck truss and asked Midas to show the HS20 loading that produced the maximum axial load in that member. And what's being displayed is uh, the, the, the colorful diagrams there are influence lines for that member for each of the loaded lanes. And the, the, the blue and red marks at the base there are, are the actual loads, the, the lane load and the point loads that were applied to produce that maximum loading in the member. So this shows you the loads graphically. If you need to see those, the numbers behind that load case, you can push the right min max load to file button down at the bottom of that menu. And Midas will then produce a .mct file, a text file, with all those loads included. You can then take that file to the MCT command shell which is a tool within MIDAS, run that file, and then that, that case is added as a static load case to your run. Then in future runs, you'll get, you'll get results for that run specifically, which you can use to take concurrent forces, so you'll, you'll have every member's result for that load case. So you can look at the concurrent member forces from that load case. So you can use that method for one case for one member, but we're not dealing with one case for one member. We want to look at thousands of cases, thousands of members. So how do we do this for a lot of members at once? Uh, MIDAS allows you to use a batch conversion feature that's part of that moving load tracer. So you can pick from that menu on the screen multiple members. You can put a list of members in, pick the load cases you want to include, and the forces you want to investigate and then run that as a batch run, and it will produce an MCT file that includes all of those load cases as separate load cases in that MCT file. So once you have produced that file, you can then take it, run it in the MCT command shell, and it will write each of those cases to your file. And the other thing that's convenient about how it does it is that it names those cases in a way so you know what's in it. It will tell you this is member you know, 2001 max FX, so you know what you're looking at. And that's the method we use to get concurrent forces for all those members we were interested in, pull them in, and take, take the output and use it in our gusset ratings. So once we've collected all the data from the gusset plates, run our 12 nonlinear wind combinations, and run all of our concurrent load conditions, we're ready to rate the gussets. So we're again pulling all that tabulated data into a spreadsheet that performs the capacity calculation and rates the gusset. Um, this screen is showing a part of that spreadsheet, and it's what it's showing in particular is the wind cases and the live load cases. So we, we are looking at each of those 12 wind cases for each member, and we are looking at the minimum and maximum loads for each member and their concurrent forces in the live load cases. So we're set up here to do six different members connecting to a single gusset. In this case, we only have four, so only the first eight of those live load cases are populated. So for each member, we have a, two live load cases, a minimum and a maximum force for that member, and then all of the concurrent forces in the, in the corresponding members. Rather than, and we, we use this method, you know, we probably could have picked and choose for each gusset plates, which ones were likely to control. But given the number we had to do, we decided to just hit every case for every plate 
to make sure we didn't miss anything. Uh, and just a brief word about the results of the rating, um, which leads into the rehabilitation slides. Uh, the results show that every member in connection on the bridge rated above 1.0 rating factor for HS20 operating and for all the legal loads, which means the bridge was safe in its current condition for all legal loading. However, we did show that there were eight diagonals in the deck truss that rated to less than HS20 inventory, which is comparable to the original design loading for the bridge. Um, the members that we rated low didn't have section walls. We, this appears to just be a difference in how the unbraced length of the, they were all compression diagonals was calculated in the original design versus what we did in the rating. But even though they did rate above 1.0 and for, for operating, WVDOT did ask us to go ahead and strengthen them as part of the rehab plans we were, we're currently producing for the bridge. So the remainder of the presentation will be discussing the, a few items from the rehabilitation plans, which we're currently working on. Um, this shows a list of the items that we're addressing in the plans. Most of these are minor repairs, and many of them are non-structural maintenance items. There are a few crack welds on the catwalks, um, some areas that need to be cleaned and painted, and a few corroded and missing bolts. Uh, we're adding drip bars in areas where there's been water infiltration. We're replacing the stringer relief joints, which are small compression seal joints in the deck where the, the breaks in the stringer lines. And we're doing repairs to the traffic barriers. Um, the two items I'm going to touch on here are the strengthening of those truss diagonals we just talked about and uh, the resetting of the roller bearings at Vince 1905. So the deck truss diagonals need to be strengthened are all the same section. They're W14 by 61 rolled sections. And they're all controlled by weak axis bending. And we're strengthening these members by bolting a pair of angles to the web to increase the weak axis bending stiffness of the member. This requires field drilling holes in the web. Uh, we considered welding them in place, but and these are compression members, but they'll be under dead load when we install these angles. So the welds themselves would take stress cycles um, from live load. So we decided we didn't want to introduce a, a, fatigue, a potential fatigue detail to a bridge that's almost entirely bolted. So we decided to go ahead and field drill those holes and install those angles. And uh, bearing repositioning. Um, the roller bearings at, at 519, the expansion, the piers where the finger joints are located. These, these rollers should be plumb at about 60 degrees, but they're significantly out of plumb at, at around 60 degrees. The primary problem is that the, the, the sole plate at the top and the base plate at the bottom are out of line at 60 degrees. There's, there's, a, there's an actual offset there. Uh, we don't know what caused that problem. It's, it's existed as long as we've inspected it. It's, it was either constructed out of line or some permanent deformation has occurred that, that we have not identified. But there's also a secondary problem in that if you draw a line along the center line of the, of the roller, that should hit the midpoint of those plates. And it doesn't. That the roller has slid relative to the plates. So our goal is to correct both of those two problems with our, with our solution. So there you, the geared plates on the outside there are retainer plates, and then those were installed specifically to prevent that roller from slipping relative to the base plate and the sole plate. Um, the original plans showed those retainer plates rigidly bolted to that center roller. Um, for whatever reason, when it was actually constructed, they were connected only at the midpoint of the roller. And that connection allows those retainer plates to slip relative to the roller. So they're not 
effective in preventing that the main roller from slipping. So our solution will hopefully correct that problem to keep those, those sets of plates in line. So there are a number of things um, we want to fix here. One is to get the roller plumb at 60 degrees, align the retainer, retainer plates with the roller, and fix the retainer plate connection to the roller. The most direct way to do this would be to vertically jack the truss off the roller, unload it, and then work on it while it's unloaded, get everything lined up and put it back. The problem is we're on top of this steel bent that's 450 feet of off the ground and with no good place to jack from. We did brainstorm for some ways to, to lift that truss, uh, but we couldn't think of any that didn't make us really uncomfortable. So we decided that we would try to reposition everything using horizontal jacking while the bearing is under load. So the next few slides walk through uh, graphically our plan for accomplishing this. So this is a schematic drawing of the, the bearings. Um, you can see the fixed bearing on the left and the misaligned roller on the right. The orange represents the, the retainer plates and then the roller itself is behind and, and gray in color. The first step is to install what we're calling the jacking assembly. And this is a steel frame that we're attaching to the bent cap using pretension thread bars. This is going to require drilling some holes through that bent cap, which we'll patch later with, with bolted cover plates. Um, on the top of the bent, we're, we've got a pushing beam back behind the bearing base plate. And we've also got a bumper plate between the two sets of bearings. So at this point, we're going to remove the retainer plates from the, the roller bearing uh, because these are misaligned and they may, we were afraid when we, do, when we move this thing horizontally, we may either fail that rod that connects the retainer plates to the, to, to the roller or otherwise damage that connection. And we're also at this point removing the welds that connect the base plate to the top of the pin cap. The next step, we are placing a jack on those thread bars that connect the, the pushing plate to the jacking frame and pulling. And we'll pull that base plate over until it makes contact with the bumper. And we've set that bumper location based on the 60 degree temperature of the bearing so that we should be aligned now. The, the upper sole plate and the lower base plate should now be aligned at it. 60 degree temperature. So now we're removing the jacking assembly and we're going to re-weld the base plate. The sole plate and the base plate are now aligned, but because the roller has slipped relative to these plates, it's still out of plumb at this point. So we have some more work to do. Now we're going to install a smaller jacking assembly on the bearing itself, and we call that the roller jacking assembly. This gets anchored to the base plate and to the sole plate, and we're again installing a pushing beam and some bumpers to, to force that roller to move how we want it to. So again, we tension those thread bars, pull the lower portion of that roller over until it's centered on the bottom base plate. We take off the jacking assembly. We're still tilted because we've, we've aligned the bottom of the roller, but we're still off center on the top portion. So now we're taking that same jacking assembly. We flip it upside down and put it on the other side of the bearing. And again, we've got our pushing beam and our bumpers in there.
we pull on those thread bars and slide the top of the roller over to the center of the sole plate. And now we should have a fully aligned roller. It's plumb, assuming it's 60 degrees out. But we still need to address the retainer plates. So at this point, we're going to reinstall those retainers. They should fit properly aligned with that bearing at this point, assuming we did all our other work correctly. We're going to hook them back on using the original connection. We're going to bolt them at the center of the roller. And then we're going to install some retaining bars. The red rectangles there are one inch by three inch bars that, that cross from retainer plate to retainer plate and restrain the bearing at four points. Those are welded to the blue rectangles or tabs that are welded to those retainer plates on the side. Uh, we like this system because it, it didn't require welding anything to the roller. We didn't feel good about welding to that roller. It's such a it's a massive steel casting that would require preheating to to make the make the welds. So, um, and we also felt this would be strong and durable enough to to keep those plates aligned. And that's all I've got. Um, I want to close by thanking West Virginia DOT for the, their support and for giving us the opportunity to work on this project and Midas Software for their help with this project and also allowing me the time to make this presentation.